In the history of mafia movies, few figures stand out as much as Joe Pesci, known for his portrayal of hyper-violent and hot-tempered gangsters. In 1990, Pesci electrified the world with his Oscar, winning performance as Tommy DeVito, an aggressive and unpredictable associate of the Lucchese crime family in the film Goodfellas. Although Joe Pesci's character was a disturbed individual in reality, he was a toned down version of the real person. The producers of Goodfellas have stated that the real Tommy was so sadistic and ruthless that audiences wouldn't have believed someone like him could actually exist. The real Tommy was so sadistic and ruthless that audiences wouldn't have believed someone like him could exist. In this video, we explore the rise and fall of the real Tommy DeSimone. Tommy was born on May 24, 1950, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, into a family with strong connections to the Cosa Nostra. His paternal grandfather, Rosario DeSimone, and his uncle, Frank DeSimone, had both been leaders of a crime family based in Los Angeles. His two brothers, Robert and Anthony, were also associates. From the Gambino family in New York, the most significant influence in Tommy's life was his family friend and mafia associate, Jimmy. Jimmy took the young Tommy under his wing and involved him in various criminal schemes, such as car the theft, insurance fraud, and cigarette smuggling. Tommy grew. He also took on less glamorous duties like serving drinks, food, and shining shoes. Although Jimmy was a big earner, and very popular due to his friendly and outgoing personality. Jimmy could never become a full member of the Mafia due to his Irish heritage. Only those of full Italian descent are eligible to be official members of the Cosa Nostra. As a result, Jimmy was considered an associate and worked under Paul Vario, a capo of the Lucchese family operating in Brooklyn, New York, Despite Jimmy's charming personality, he harbored a deep, sated darkness and was notorious for his explosive temper. Henry Hill detailed this in his 1985 book, describing Jimmy's reputation for being wild. He could kill you without hesitation, yet be as polite as shaking your hand. He was terrifying and scared even the most frightening guys. Nobody really knew where they stood with him, but he was also smarter than most of the guys around him and a big earner. Jimmy always brought in money for Paul and the crew, and that was ultimately why his madness was tolerated. In 1963, Jimmy introduced the 14-year-old Tommy to Henry Hill, who was 21 at the time, and had just been discharged from the army. Jimmy and Henry had recently gotten involved in cigarette smuggling, which was proving to be highly lucrative. Recently involved in cigarette smuggling, which was proving to be highly lucrative, Jimmy asked Henry to take care of young Tommy and teach him the ins and outs of the cigarette business. Soon, the two were earning nearly $400 each day, selling smuggled cigarettes at construction sites and subway stations throughout Brooklyn. They made so much money that they eventually bought their own semi-trailer, which they frequently drove to North Carolina and filled to the brim with boxes of cigarettes. These boxes sold for 21 cents in North Carolina compared to New York, where the same carton would cost much more due to differences in cigarette taxes. This plan was so successful that it didn't take long for the market to become saturated with cheap cigarettes as other groups like the Colombo Gang noticed the scheme and began smuggling cigarettes as well. By that time, Henry and Tommy had moved on to stealing cars and sending them to Haiti, which earned them a considerable profit for each vehicle. They were also involved in numerous other crimes, such as extortion, fraud, receiving stolen property, and truck hijacking. Even in those early days, Tommy quickly gained a reputation for having an explosive temper and was known for losing his cool easily. He also seemed to enjoy hurting others, as it was a tradition of his to test any new firearm by shooting a random civilian. One day, Henry witnessed this firsthand while they were walking down a street in Brooklyn. Tommy, who was 17 at the time, shouted at a random passerby. When the man turned around, Tommy pulled out a gun and shot him several times. The man was a complete stranger, and as he lay dying, 
Henry remarked that it was cold-blooded. Tommy responded, Well, I'm a bad cat. Henry later speculated that Tommy's bloodlust stemmed from the fact that one of his older brothers had collaborated with the police years earlier. And because of that, he felt the need to prove himself, who stood only five feet four inches in real life. However, Tommy was muscular, stood six feet two inches tall, and was known for his intimidating physical presence. In 1948, New York International Airport, later renamed John F. Kennedy International Airport, opened in Queens, New York. By the early 1960s, over $30 billion in cargo passed through the airport each year. This proved to be an attractive opportunity. Irresistible to local gangsters, the criminal organization in New York soon had people at the airport watching for potential targets. No one was better at airport theft than Jimmy, who created a complex network of accomplices and collaborators that kept him informed about the best loot arriving. Given that many of the 50,000 airport employees were from the local area, it was easy for Jimmy to intimidate them into compliance, and some were already indebted to Jimmy and his associates. An example of an associate was a truck driver for Eastern Airlines who had accumulated a massive gambling debt with one of Jimmy's bookies. In exchange for forgiving the debt, the truck driver accidentally dropped some mailbags on the way to the post office. When Jimmy picked them up, he discovered they contained nearly $500,000 in cash, money orders, and stocks. While many airport employees accepted bribes or were threatened into helping, some honest individuals went to the police. Police officers who bravely stood up were routinely killed by Jimmy and his gang, with Tommy often acting as the enforcer. Corrupt police officers on Jimmy's payroll regularly informed him about potential witnesses who were then swiftly killed before they could cause any problems. In one year, more than 10 of these individuals were murdered on Jimmy's orders, with their bodies eventually discovered in the trunks of various abandoned cars in the airport parking lot. On April 7, 1967, Jimmy's gang orchestrated what was, at that time, their biggest single heist. According to an internal source, according to an internal source, Air France was the carrier for U.S. Money was routinely exchanged in Southeast Asia and then brought back to the United States by the airline for deposit in American banks. According to an informant, these deliveries usually consisted of three or four packages, each containing $6,000, making it an attractive and easy target for theft. The informant had indicated that stealing the money would be relatively simple due to the way it was packaged and transported. Acting on this tip on April 7, Tommy and Henry planned to intercept one of these deliveries. They drove to the Air France cargo terminal at Kennedy Airport, bringing with them an empty suitcase, ready to execute their plan. The two simply entered the area without being challenged and used a duplicate key to enter the vault. They then filled their suitcase to the brim with money and simply walked out with $20,000. No one was hurt, and no shots were fired. The robbery wasn't discovered until two days later. With his share of the loot, Henry bought a restaurant on Queens Boulevard. Although he initially planned for it to be a legitimate business and kept it away from his criminal associates, within months it turned into another mafia hangout and became especially popular among high-ranking members of the Gambino family. It was here that Tommy would commit his most infamous act in early June of 1970. William Billy Batts, Benfina, also known as Billy Batts, had just been released from prison after serving an eight-year sentence for selling narcotics to an undercover police officer. When a mobster gets out of prison, it is customary for his friends to throw him a big party to celebrate. Bats was a member of the Gambino family and also a lifelong friend of the future Gambino family boss, John Gotti. The celebration took place at a nightclub owned by Jimmy. Late in the night, a visibly drunk Billy noticed Tommy sitting at the end of the bar. Tommy was only 20 years old at the time, and Billy recognized him as the 12-year-old shoeshine boy he had known years before his imprisonment, now all grown up. Billy then made a sarcastic comment, 
asking Tommy if he still shined shoes. Henry later described what happened next. Henry said, I looked at Tommy and could see he was furious about the way Billy was talking. Tommy was losing it, but he couldn't do or say anything. Billy was a made man, and if Tommy even laid a hand on him, Tommy would be dead. We kept drinking and laughing, and just when I thought maybe everything had blown over, Tommy leaned over to Jimmy and me and said, I'm going to kill that bastard. While I tried to dissuade him, Jimmy took the opposite approach, and over the next few days, he continuously reminded Tommy of what had happened and the disrespect Billy had shown him. Jimmy probably did this because, before Billy went to prison, he had been running a lucrative loan, sharking business that Jimmy had taken over while Billy was in custody. Now, Billy was eager to get his business back, something Jimmy had no intention of allowing. Two weeks later, on June 11, Billy was in the bar drinking near midnight. Tommy walked in and noticed Billy was alone, so he quickly whispered something to Jimmy, who then approached Billy and started buying him more drinks. Tommy then leaned over to Henry and whispered, Keep him here, I'm going to get a bag, which Henry knew meant he was going to get a body bag. While Tommy was gone, Jimmy kept Billy entertained, telling him stories and making sure his glass was never empty. It seemed like Billy was having a great time, but 20 minutes later, Tommy returned, this time carrying a bag in one hand and a gun in the other. As Tommy approached, Jimmy silently put his arm around Billy's shoulder in a friendly manner. Henry described what happened next, saying, I was on the other side of the bar when Tommy pulled the gun out of his pocket. The moment he saw what was happening, Jimmy tightened his arm around Billy's neck. Shine these shoes, you bastard, Tommy shouted, smashing the gun into the side of Billy's head. Billy's eyes widened in shock as Tommy hit him again. Jimmy maintained his grip as blood began to pour from Billy's head, appearing almost black. The beating was so savage that the three men assumed Billy was dead, so they pushed his body into the trunk of Henry's car. They knew that, since Billy was a made man, the Gambinos wouldn't spare any effort to find his killers, so it was imperative to hide his body where it would never be discovered. Jimmy mentioned he knew a guy who owned a veterinary hospital upstate in New York where no one would think to look. With no other options, the three men got into Henry's car and began their drive. While on the road, a loud noise started coming from the trunk. So loud that it woke up Jimmy. The three of them exchanged worried glances before realizing that Billy was still alive. Tommy slammed on the brakes, grabbed the shovel without saying a word, and the three men got out of the car. They waited until no other vehicles were in sight before opening the trunk. Tommy began to beat Billy with the shovel while Jimmy struck him with a wrench. After just a few seconds, they closed the trunk and resumed their drive in silence. By the time they reached their destination, it was nearly morning, and it took them almost an hour to dig a hole big enough. They covered Billy with lime, filled the hole, and returned to New York City. However, their work with Billy was not yet finished. Three months later, Jimmy discovered that his friend, who owned the veterinary hospital, had sold the property to housing developers. So... He ordered Tommy and Henry to return to the site and exhume Billy's body to bury it elsewhere. The two men went back to New York City with Billy's body in the trunk of Henry's new Pontiac Catalina, convertible, and buried it in the basement of a lounge. A couple of months later, they dug Billy up again and placed him in a trash compactor at a junkyard in New Jersey. For weeks, Henry couldn't escape the smell of Billy's body. No matter how many times he washed his clothes or took a shower, he could still smell it everywhere. Eventually, Henry burned the clothes he was wearing that day and also abandoned his car at a junkyard. Tommy thought Henry was crazy and said he would have gladly kept the car to remind him every day of how he had dealt with that miserable bastard, Billy. Another dark episode would reveal just how ruthless Tommy could be. While they were drinking and playing cards, their 16-year-old waiter, Michael Spider Janko, forgot to bring Tommy's drink, which led Tommy to shoot him in the thigh as punishment. A week later, Spider was back at the card game, serving drinks with a cast on his leg. At 3 a.m., an intoxicated Tommy began yelling at Spider, demanding that he dance for his amusement. In an act of defiance, 
Spider told Tommy to go to hell, which led Tommy to shoot him three times in the chest, killing him instantly. For a moment, there was silence until Jimmy finally stood up and shouted, All right, you idiot. If you're going to be such a big fool, dig the hole yourself. Tommy felt insulted and, in a fit of anger, took Spider's body and dug a hole in the basement. Tommy was losing control, and by this point even routine extortion missions were ending in murder. A couple of weeks later, while Jimmy and his crew were unloading stolen cigarettes at a truck warehouse, the foreman, who had no idea who Jimmy or his men were, demanded to see their union cards. The foreman warned that if they couldn't provide their union cards, he would clear the loading dock. Jimmy tried to reason with the foreman, then attempted to bribe him, and when that failed, he resorted to threats. However, the foreman refused to be intimidated, so Jimmy left, and the next day he sent Tommy and another team member, Stanley Diamond, to scare him. Foreman lived in New Jersey, and during the drive, both Tommy and Stanley grew increasingly frustrated with the situation and with the foreman's refusal to listen to Jimmy. They had to make the trip to New Jersey, and Jimmy had instructed them to simply intimidate the foreman into cooperating next time. However, instead of just intimidating him, they beat him to death in his own home. No one was safe from Tommy's sadistic nature, not even his friends or loved ones. In 1972, Henry was convicted of extortion and sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. While serving his sentence in a Pennsylvania penitentiary, Tommy seized the opportunity and attempted to assault Henry's wife, Karen. When she resisted, he instead brutally attacked her and left her injured. Henry was released on parole on July 12, 1978, and almost immediately afterward, a local gambler named Marty Krugman informed him that the German airline Lufthansa was transporting large amounts of us, dollars to its cargo terminal at John F. Kennedy International Airport. Henry took this information to Jimmy, who began planning what would eventually become the heist of the century. The robbery was a complete success, and in the end, Jimmy and his crew made off with nearly $6 million in cash and $875,000 in jewelry, making it the largest robbery ever committed on us. Soil at that time. After the heist, an associate of the Luches family named Parnell Stax Edwards was tasked with disposing of the getaway vehicle. He was supposed to drive it to New Jersey for destruction, but instead, he got drunk and left the car parked in front of a fire hydrant outside his girlfriend's house. The police discovered the vehicle two days after the robbery and found Stax's fingerprints all over it, quickly linking him to the heist. After learning about what had happened, Paul Vario ordered Tommy to eliminate Stax, which he did on December 18 by shooting him five times in the head. This would turn out to be Tommy's last murder, as unbeknownst to him, the Gambinos were already searching for him and seeking revenge. In addition to the murder of Billy Batts, Tommy had also incurred the wrath of the Gambinos by killing Ronald Gerard in 1974. Gerard was a protege of John Gottige, of John Gotti and a popular member of the Gambino family, with a reputation as a high-stakes gambler. Five years later, on January 14, 1979, Tommy's wife reported him missing to the police, claiming that the last time she had seen him was a few weeks earlier, when he had borrowed money from her. Exactly what happened is unclear, but it is known that the week after Christmas, Jimmy and Henry traveled to Florida to resolve some issues related to a recent drug deal. Tommy would have normally accompanied them, but since he was becoming a made man, he had to stay in New York for his initiation ceremony. While the two were in Florida, Jimmy went to a payphone to call home and check in. After leaving the booth, he had tears in his eyes. I don't know what's going on, he said. They just told me Tommy was hit. The Gotti crew took him out. It's because Tommy killed Billy Bats and a guy named Ronald Gerald. They were made men with the Gambinos, and Tommy killed them without authorization. The Gambinos found out about Tommy's role in Billy Bats' death, and it's believed that Tommy was taken out as a result. 
Paul Vario, who secretly had an affair with Henry's wife, Karen, while he was serving a federal prison sentence, had never had much sympathy for Tommy due to his unpredictable nature. Some believe that when Vario learned about Tommy's attempt to assault Karen, it was the last straw. However, these are only theories, and we may never know the full story of Tommy Desimone's final hours. It was thought that Tommy had been buried in a reputed mafia graveyard on the border of Brooklyn and Queens, near John F. Kennedy Airport, where the bodies of other mobsters were recovered by the police in 2004. However, Tommy Desimone's remains have never been found. If you enjoyed the story of Desimone's life, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more gripping tales from history's underworld. Stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you for our next episode. Thank you for watching.